Welcome to the seminar on people, computers, and design. Um, I will do a brief introduction today. We started a touch late. Um, I guess Will Wright, who's our speaker today, is one of these people who makes me uncomfortably aware of the generation gap. And that's not because of him. He's sort of in between my generation and the next one. But because the things that he's done, uh, in particular, he was the inventor and, of SimCity and a whole series of innovative uh, programs and games since then, are things which I discovered as a computer science professor learning about interface design. And when I look out into a classroom full of students nowadays, they're people who discovered it the way that I discovered model cars, right? It is, they grew up with it. Uh, the, the kind of tools and, and uh, games and uh, whatever you want to call them he's producing have really been a major part of life with computers, what it means to be computers and use computers for the generation that's just now uh, appearing in college. Uh, and my own intuition, which I, of course, can't validate since I'm in the wrong generation, but is that that's going to lead over time to a real shift in the way not just that people think about games, but people think about computers and computing in general. Um, and today he's going to be talking about uh, his experience and his ideas along those lines. Thank you, Terry. Um, yeah, I guess I'm kind of from that in-between generation. Uh, Spent a lot of time building models when I was a kid. Way too much time building models when I was a kid. Um, and I really was fascinated by the idea of these kind of microsystems, models, micro worlds, whatever. Uh, you got there now, and you can't find models the way they used to be. It used to be you could find plastic models, wood models all over the place. And that's what kids did, especially boys. Um, whereas girls would play with the dolls, which was a different kind of modeling, more of a social system model. Uh, that whole industry seems to have been displaced recently by the video game industry, which to me is kind of sad in a way, because on the modeling front, there was so much creativity involved. You would spend so much time, and there were just infinite levels of progression. I started out with these kind of plastic models you'd glue together. Then I kind of got into the wooden ones, the preformed wooden ones, where you'd glue them together and build these airplanes and put the paper over it. And then eventually started building my own just out of scratch wood. And it was really interesting to me because you could get such a good sense of the structural definition of a system with these models. So when I got a computer in my early 20s, a friend of mine talked me into buying one, I very quickly realized how cool the computer was as a modeling tool. The uh, computer all of a sudden allows you to start modeling process in addition to just structure. So uh, my definitions here are kind of loose and freewheeling, but uh, like a tree, the structure might be the leaves and the branches and whatnot. Process might be combustion, you know, a structural change in the tree. So for the first time with a computer, I had a tool that I could start modeling process with. And as a model builder, I just went hog wild, taught myself to program, and kind of got into the games industry. Um, this is about 15 years ago. Now, I was supposed to talk here today about interface design, and I'm going to try to. But really, I'm going to touch on three major areas, I think. I'm going to talk on simulation design, game design, and interface design. Because those three, to me, are very tightly linked. I can't just design the interface after the game's done or design the game in isolation from the interface. Um, each one of these supports the other. And a lot of times, there'll be a game I want to do, but I can't design the interface to support it or the simulation underneath that it needs to have. So to me, these three kind of go in this dynamic process and design together. So um, I'll be talking about all three today. I'm going to be showing you some of our older games kind of in chronological order and going through some of the issues we were thinking about, why we did things the way we did, um, and then lessons learned after it was out there and hundreds of thousands of people were complaining about it and telling us how bad a job we did. Um, we get some more perspective after time. And then you know, each one after that, we would try to address the problems. And usually, we'd overshoot, or we'd go off in a totally different direction and invent new problems for the users. Uh, on the simulation side, most of the games we do are about real world systems. Um, so the simulation, in a sense, is leading the charge on the educational front. We pick a system that we want to educate the user about. And then we look at the simulation design. and how much of the system do we want to wrap the user's mind around? Um, there are a lot of issues there in terms of how much of a simulation do we put in? How, 
high is the fidelity of the situation? When does it match reality versus users' expectations? Um, on the game design, a lot of times we will decide to make the simulation match the user's expectations rather than reality uh, in certain cases, if otherwise it would destroy the gameplay. Um, on the game design, games are really all about problem solving, constraints, challenges. So simulation is more about modeling the real world. So the simulation is where the problem is usually embedded. We will build a simulation so that the problems come up. Uh, as far as the simulation is concerned, they're not problems. It's just data going through some uh, algorithms. It's the game design that basically points you toward a goal. So the game design is actually going to tell you what is a problem in the simulation, what constraints the user has to deal with that problem. And those constraints are typically where the gameplay is going to come from. Uh, the interface has to support both of these processes. Uh, you have to visualize the simulation. There are a lot of issues with how much of the simulation do we make explicit to the user. Sometimes we don't want to show every last detail of the simulation to the user. Uh, we want to sometimes prop up this illusion of reality. And that's one of these issues where the game design is in opposition to the simulation design sometimes. As an educator, a lot of people would rather see simulations that were very explicit in the way they modeled, or in uh, what the user sees of the modeling process. In other words, they want the users to know exactly how SimCity is calculating the traffic rate, or why crime appears, what the algorithm for crime is. On a game design front, that's not always desirable. If you make the system too explicit, A, you destroy that illusion of reality, and B, you take away some of the challenge of the problem solving. One of the things that we think about uh, on the education front is that when we're designing a model, we're not necessarily designing a computer model. Our real end product is the uh, mental model in the player's head. We're trying to give them maybe a more robust model of the way a city works or a planet works or whatever. The computer model really is just an incremental step in that direction. It's like a compiler for the mental model. So. Uh, The actions that the user is allowed to do in the interface basically define how you can deal with the problems. And these are the constraints. Most of the uh, interfaces I'm going to show you conceptually can be kind of split into the data output, you know, problem identification side, and the data input problem solving side, where the tools are applied and the user actually has input to the model. The, uh, one of the paradigms we've tried to use in designing these simulations is to think of them a little bit more as toys rather than games. That is, to leave them a little more open-ended. They're not necessarily as goal-directed as most games would be. Most games, you have a very single-minded goal. You solve that, you win. Uh, the kind of simulations we've been moving towards really are a little more open-ended, where in a lot of cases, the user is deciding what the goal is before they play. When they play SimCity, for instance, we don't necessarily tell them you have to get the biggest city you can, or you have to make your residents as happy as can be. People will actually take it and play it different ways. They'll basically identify, they'll think of, well, what's my goal today? Or what kind of city do I want to build? I want to build a city that has the happiest possible residents. And they'll try to meet that goal. So it's a little more open-ended. The way a ball can be used for different games, the user decides what the goal is. You know, if I kick the ball through the goal, then I win. Uh, that's the way I think of these kind of as software toys rather than games. Um, there was a really cool uh, short story written by Stanislaw Lim called The Seventh Sally. And he describes this, he's got these robot cultures and they go around doing these things. And uh, one of the robots who was an inventor, Turl, came across this asteroid where there was this deposed dictator all by himself and he was really sad because he didn't have a kingdom to rule. And so Turl invented this magical invention for him and it was a box with a whole kingdom inside that he could rule and enslave and do bad things to with little knobs to control them. He never got real explicit about what the interface was. It was really fancy knobs. Yeah, really fancy knobs. But I mean, he could go down to the point of you know, issuing decrees and you know, making that guy slip off his horse and doing these little things in the midst of a battle. And it was just the idea of it is kind of what's uh, inspired me through the years to build these things. We were nowhere near building Turl's invention. but. Uh, I think, to me, that's kind of why I do a lot of this. Um, I'm going to start off with uh, an old program, SimEarth. 
and go through some of the elements. Let me change the monitor setting real quick here. Now this project was a little bit ambitious. Um, we were trying to do a simulation of the planet. Turn off the annoying music. Uh, so you know, we started this project. The intent of this project was to kind of show how complex planetary systems are show the linkages between various systems that most people don't think about. Most people, uh, up till recently, interdisciplinary study has been kind of a, a backwater thing, and now it's getting really in the forefront. But people have been doing, for instance, climate models, or evolution models, or uh, biome models in isolation without regard for the way these things link together. So one of our intents was to show the interrelationship between these different fields of study. Another was to give a sense of the vast time scales over which the planets evolved. Um, and so our task here was to kind of figure out what would the interface to a planet be. The, uh, the main window you see here is a map of the planet we have. Um, let me load Earth. It'll give you a little bit more sense of the scale here. This is one of the scenarios you can play with, with Earth modern day. At this level, we're getting an overview of the planet. Um, I can actually open another window here. This is a local window. This is what we use for uh, the local control of the planet. I can actually use this to move that around as a little finder for it. Um, so in the interface here, one of the conceptual things that we've done in most of our products is that we have a distinction here between the global in this window and the local in this window. That distinction also applies to the controls and the displays that you get from each window. Uh, on the illusion of reality, whenever you look at a map, it's hard to imagine that you're really seeing a real system. So after playing with this for a while in development, um, we started thinking, you know, this is, looks like a simulation. It doesn't look like a toy planet. How do we make it look more like a toy planet? So we went through a lot of uh, hoops and kind of came up with this, which is displaying the same data, actually in a more restrictive format, because you're only seeing half the planet at one time. But uh, in some ways, it gives you more the feeling of playing with the planet. So this is my little toy planet. This works the same. All the maps that display on this work the same. Uh, this actually turned out to be the appropriate place for us to show the core, because as you play the game, the model of the geosphere includes the core coalescing, which is changing the continental drift rates and a few other factors. Um, this really. For the amount of effort and time we spent on this, I think, was more of a macho programmer thing. Uh, let's see if we can map this onto a sphere in real time. Uh, a horrendous amount of code and time and effort went into that, which probably was not worth it. Um, but live and learn. On the bottom here, we have controls. Uh, I'll go through them very briefly. Uh, this is just the terrain, basically. Events show on this map. Um, this is continental drift rates. We can hold the button down and get a view of the plate boundary, what the plate names are. Uh, on the continental drift in this game, the continents are drifting around at certain time scales, and it actually records the drift. So I can come back over here and replay the current continental drift. This is a, an internal record that it's keeping of the latest continental drift. One of the inputs you have in the program is creating earthquakes, and you pick out which way you want to push the plates, and um, kind of a high level of control in this game. This turns off the oceans, so you can see the ocean floor terrain. Uh, we initially had this just toggle on and off. We found that by animating it, um, people got a much better feel. It's not so much on Earth, because the continental plate boundaries are so distinct, but on other planets. So they got a much better feel by actually animating the water going up and down. This is the uh, ocean temperatures. Uh, it's ocean currents, atmosphere, rainfall air currents, biome distribution. You'll notice for each of these maps, there's a small key that appears down here, showing you how to interpret the colors of the vectors. Now, one thing about this interface that uh, we later came back and looked at it and kind of said, it's so information dense. Um, primarily, when we were designing this game many years ago, uh, 
this was pretty much the standard screen size, 640 by 480. Um, since then, standard screen sizes have gotten much bigger. At that time, we were very concerned with information density. How much could we display without the user having to bring up another window or uh, obscure what they're seeing? So consequently, most of our interfaces came out kind of like these uh, really fancy car stereos with the billion and a half buttons, you know? And uh, you know, if you're into playing with buttons and all that, in the showroom floor, it's really fun to play with, right? You know, it's got all little buttons and modes and lights. And, but then you're driving down the road, and you just want to hear music, OK? So you get totally lost with all the buttons. Um, after finishing this program, I started feeling that you know this was kind of the fancy car stereo. Maybe we could have been a little less dense on it. But part of that, again, was pulled in by the simulation design. You know, Everything in here is supporting the simulation and what we were trying to do with that. So perhaps that's as much a criticism of the simulation as anything else. So on that theme, down here where the key is to maximize what we can do in this window, we have a toggle for that, even. If we toggle it to this, what we're now getting is a overtime graph of the map that we're currently seeing up here. So right now we're seeing the biome map up here, and this is the uh, current biomass of the planet. Um, I'm just starting the model, so all these are coming up from zero right now. This is the uh, average air temperature across the planet, rainfall, etc. So the buttons up here along the top basically are all data output for the player. There are certain things associated with each of these fields that are global. And you can double click, for instance, on this one, which is the biome map. And here you get a global readout of the uh, ratios of biomes on the planet. This is like grassland to forest to jungle to swamp to desert. Um, same with the other ones. This is the uh, life form display, diversity display. I double click on that. I get global readings on the different life forms on the planet. So we've tried to collapse most of the uh, information that you can get from the simulation on the global side up here on the top row. Now on the bottom row, we have these buttons. We have geosphere, atmosphere, biosphere, uh, civilization. These are the global inputs the player has. So we have on the top here again the outputs, the bottom here the inputs. These are the factors that the player can control. I can grab the axle tilt of the Earth, and right here I can start moving it around causing chaos. I can bring up the meteorite impacts. I can increase the continental drift rate. Um, th these are rather major uh, inputs for a game, but it was kind of aiming high. The, uh, one of the things that we've tried pretty hard at, and I think we've been pretty successful at, is keeping numbers out of the user's face. So whenever possible, we do these things graphically. So uh, just notice in here how few numbers you see, but yet we're trying to display a lot of information about the planet. Now, the local side, we have the same kind of things. Um, we have down here mostly the information output, except it's here it's mostly uh, organized as filters. So this is turning off the ocean. This is turning off the biome display, the city display. These up here are the inputs. These are new life forms I can drop down, or cities. I can put dinosaurs in North America. Um, I can raise and lower terrain with this. Uh, I can just grab and move things with this. I can move dinosaurs to South America. Um, these are events I can actually drop. Uh, this is really where most of the control to the player comes in the game. Um, I can you know, drop a meteorite in the Atlantic, causing tidal waves and destruction. I can uh, pick out an earthquake and change the uh, vector of the plate boundary. So these are the kind of things that the player does in this game. Um, I want to talk a little bit in each interface I show you here about the help system, because our help systems have kind of evolved over the years. We've tried and tried and tried, and we never can get people to use them, basically, is what the short story here. Um, in this one, the shift key turns the icon into a help icon. And any button or control you click on will come up with a description. Now, uh, I know this is really standard stuff now, but this program was designed Oh, about seven years ago. So back then, there weren't that many established. This is before balloon help. This is before the little pop-up stuff and windows and all that. So we didn't really have any established thing to, uh, to go by there. The, uh, down here, you can see it. It's a very confusing display, which is why we put all these in. What basically the users ended up doing was turning off most of the displays when they were trying to deal with a certain problem. And then uh, 
dealing with it on a local or global level. Very rarely did they have all these displays on. We can also turn on overlay things like the heat and rainfall maps on top of this, which uh, makes it even more confusing. Now, the time scales was one of the major th intents of this program. So I'm going to start a new planet here. This game actually runs at four time scales, what we call the geologic time scale, evolution, civilized, and technology. We were trying to show how the changes on the Earth have accelerated over time uh, based on the life primarily. So in this game, it runs at the geologic time scale until you've evolved um, multicellular life. And generally, it's going by a million years at a click. And then uh, at some point, you evolve multicellular life, and then it slows down. And it starts going by a few hundred thousand years at a click. And then once you've evolved intelligent life, which is not necessarily mammals, it could be radiates or reptiles or whatever in this game, uh, it slows down again. Each one of these is dealing with different factors. Uh, the simulation itself changes depending on what time scale you're working at. We had a hard time communicating this to the user except through time. I mean, they would only really get the sense of this as they played through the whole game. But we did try to organize the, in, the uh, interface to support this. For instance, I can start a planet here, starting a random planet. This is roughly when Earth began. It's really red hot. Uh, we're getting a lot of meteorite impacts. The continents are drifting around. Um, the oceans will form soon as the water condenses out of the atmosphere, as the planet's cooling. Um, down here at the bottom, the information displays I showed you before, we basically organize those according to time scale. So here, we're evolving very quickly. The kind of events we're getting, meteorite impacts, this is showing us uh, tidal waves, meteorites, major volcanic eruptions. Um, continental drift map, you can see, is changing very quickly here. So roughly, the icons on the bottom here are organized from the things that occur over the longest time scales on the left to the things that occur over the shortest time scales on the right. See on the right here, we have civilization. So basically, as the game is progressing and you're advancing, if you start with a, a scratch planet like this, you're trying to evolve life and promote it to higher intelligence, your focus will actually be moving down this row. As you move to the evolution time scale, the climate model will get uh, higher fidelity. And you'll start concerning yourself with these factors. As life evolves, you'll start concerning yourself with the biomes and the life forms. So basically, what we were trying to do here, and maybe I'll, I'll get right now a little bit, oh, before I do that, let me show you a few more windows, because this has a little bit to do with my uh, post-mortem. Let me pause the model for a second. Other, model, other uh, windows we have in here, we have a history window, which has all the same factors collapsed on the history graph. We have reports, which will give you a report on the current state of the planet based on your goals. And then we have our little Gaia window. <laughs> now, this, this is our first stupid attempt at an agent-based interface. Uh, we, after we basically, this, pro this product uh, grew through accretion. OK, so we started with a simple little climate model. Said, oh, that's cool. Let's put in a continental drift model. Oh, that's cool. Let's put in an evolution model. Oh, that's cool. Let's put in a civilization model. So of course, us as the designers, you know, it made a lot of sense. We were layering this model, and it was building, and everything was resting on layers below it, and it all made sense. But now, we showed this to uh, new users you know, who are looking to buy some quick entertainment. right? And they look at this, and they start opening the windows and all this. And, they were quite overwhelmed. Um, actually, I got a paper from somebody who was doing uh, learning studies. And they, they proved they were actually doing some studies on group learning. They proved that it took five people to play Sim Earth. One person just couldn't you know, divide up the conceptual things and make the linkages. So this is our, our last ditch attempt at trying to give some point source. It collapsed all the data into one score, give the user some sense of how they were doing. Um, this little face actually kind of changes depending on how you're doing it. Right now, it's kind of uh, in an indeterminate state. But it'll be really happy sometimes if the bio, uh, biosphere is really thriving. Other times, it'll look really mad. You know, we can come in and I can, uh, well, let's see, turn off the sun or something. It doesn't like that. Yeah, turn the sun off here. Now we go to this display. Or actually, got the biome display. Oh, just as we evolved life, too. <laughs> So here, the planet will freeze up now really quick. Polar ice caps will crawl down. You can see the uh, air temperature dropping precipitously on the graph down here. These are the kind of problems that we were trying to get the user to face in this uh, program. Uh, and 
some of like the evolution time scale frequently you would get a runaway greenhouse effect or uh, the planet would overheat and the oceans would boil off which wasn't really good for your civilizations um, but on the post-mortem for this one you know I think we had too much window clutter uh, we were trying to stretch the user in too many conceptual directions at once it, had we maybe uh, cut down the simulation to just include climate or geosphere or a few other things I think we probably could have gotten people to get deeper into it but probably the biggest failure of this had to do with the failure mode itself um, Really, if you're dealing with conflicts and challenges in a game and problems to solve, the whole game, the whole thing is about failure. Really, you want the game, the user to be failing continuously in an entertaining way. The user has to confront problems, fail at them several times, but know why they failed. Uh, generally, when you play a really good game, no matter what it is, even if it's Doom or something like that, you know, I went around this corner, I got blasted. I know why I got blasted. Next time, I'm not going to go around that corner so fast. I'm going to sneak around the corner or go the other way. It's really important that when the user fails, that they understand why they failed so that they will go back to play it again the next time and then fail further down the line. In this program, people were failing, and they had no idea why. You know, they'd be sitting here playing the game, and all of a sudden, the planet would freeze up. And as designers of the simulation, we had no idea why either. The simulation was just you know, too complex, and they had a lot of chaotic kind of attractors in the attraction space. And it was kind of like you're rolling this marble through this very f flat space, and every now and then it falls into one of these chaotic, chaotic attractors. And we can't really say why. So really, that was almost a failure of the uh, simulation design. The game design just couldn't uh, convey that to the user, you know, even with constraints. Um, we had a few things that worked a little better. One of the things we stuck in here, I'll just show you real quick, is you can load Mars. And so on Mars, all you're trying to do is terraform it. You have little things you can drop in the environment on the local level. Oops. I can drop down uh, CO2 generators, or I can uh, impact Mars with ice meteors. If I do enough of those, I'll start forming an ocean. Uh, one of the other tools we gave the player was a monolith, which kind of increases the sentience of the little creatures on the planet. On the failure mode, um, one thing I just want to mention real briefly is that uh, I've seen two different failure modes between kids and adults. There seems to be a big difference. Um, adults, primarily ones that uh, kind of grew up before the computer generation really got into full swing, when they're put in front of a computer, they're afraid of failure. Generally, they're timid. They're, they're very... Uh, they think twice before they click a button. They don't just try anything. Whereas kids, they fail all the time. You know, they kind of like failure. You know, failure doesn't bother them because they're always failing. When you see a kid build a tower of blocks, you know, they'll build it and they'll knock it down. Oh, it's fun. What's important for the kid is that the failure mode is fun and interesting. Okay. What kids don't like is a boring failure mode. Adults are uncomfortable with failure in general, which is what makes kids so cool. You know, they're just really fun to watch them and that's I think one of the reasons they learn so fast you know they're not afraid to fail and that failure is really the basis of their learning um, so when we show games to this to kids even something this complex it's surprising I've had eight nine-year-olds playing this game that knew everything about it every little control in there they knew what it did and how it worked because they just went in there you know with both guns blazing pushing everything and playing with it and they had the uh, their interest level stayed up enough, and they didn't care that the planet kept freezing up or boiling over. You know, to them, that was cool. To the adults, they do it, and the planet freezes up, and, oh, no, I can't play this. It's too complex. And so they run away screaming. I'm going to skip to the next one really quick, which is uh, we decided that that was a little bit too much for the user to bite off, a little too complex, too many windows. So um, we kind of swung the other extreme on this one. This is Sim Ant. Next one, we decided we would uh, instead scale back our expectations a little bit and just simulate an ant colony. And once again, turn off the annoying music. Now, in this one, again, we have the interface kind of broken out into uh, local and global areas. This is primarily the local window. This is my little ant, that little yellow ant there. If I click in the window, that my little ant crawls around, digs tunnels. This is uh, where most of the global information is on this window. In this game, it's a little different. Instead of having the tools on the side, the, tool, the primary tool in this game is the ant. So most of what you do in this game is by navigating this little ant around. Now, I just came out of the ground. Now, you'll notice something here. The, uh, when you're 
Outside, the viewpoint is straight down two-dimensional. When you're in the nest, it's side view two-dimensional. We actually had plans at the beginning of this for a very elaborate three-dimensional display of the nest and the way it really looks. We did a few prototypes, and most people were just totally baffled. Just the, the 3D navigation to them just totally confused them. So we decided to fall back on the experience of the users. We really wanted the users to uh, have direct experience and be able to map this into the real experience. So most users' experience of seeing an ant nest is in an ant farm, which is you know two-dimensional, basically, side view like this. Uh, most people see ants on the ground straight down like this. This turned out to be no problem at all, even though you're going through this what seemed at the time a major viewpoint shift just by going out of the hole, most people didn't even notice the fact, didn't even mention it. Um, this ant can actually uh, control other ants to some degree. I can recruit ants. I don't think I have too many. Let me speed up the game a little bit here. In this game, what you do is you crawl around, look for food, feed your colony, uh, establish food trails. Here's some food over here. I can go pick up a piece, um, bring it back to my queen. The, uh, in some Earth, on the local window, we had scroll bars, as this window has. But we wanted to have the ant self-centering. Oh, we're starting to get a rainstorm here. That's what that blue stuff is. I have it on pause. So here's how the user basically plays this game, is they go get food, establish food trails, start fighting. They're at the other end of this piece of ground, is a red colony of ants. And so what you're doing in this game is you're actually battling the red ants for dominance. Once you destroy the red ants, you win this patch. Um, so this is the local here in this window. This is the global in this window. We have in this game actually kind of a meta game. So this little area of ground here represents about uh, four square feet of ground. This actually is the whole game field. So this little blinking square on the side here is the current patch of ground we're in. The uh, object of the game here is to actually start breeding new colonies and starting to take over the yard. So you actually start spreading out as the red ants are spreading out. At this point, it becomes kind of a territorial game like Go. Uh, and the real reward in this game is if you can get into the uh, house here. And so you're trying to get the ants to invade the house. And the, the highest food content areas are like around the fridge and sink and whatever. So. This is kind of the strategic game you're playing. Uh, the tactical game is down at the local level. Let me pop back to the local level here. Um, in this game, we've tried to keep the failure modes, after the same Earth experience, very direct and obvious. So if I'm crawling around and die, usually I know why. So in this case, I walk by a spider and get slurped up. Um, now, in, in today's multimedia environment, that would have been a 10-minute video sequence, you know. With a, but uh, again, this is way back. They shipped on like one disc kind of a thing. Um, so, but we didn't want the emphasis in the game design to be on not dying, because we really wanted to get the, uh, the idea across that it doesn't really matter if an ant dies. It's the colony that matters. The ants are more like the cells. The colony is more like the organism. So in the game design, we were trying to support that idea by basically making death free. When you die, you just come back as another ant. Your ant colony's lost one ant. That's not a big issue. Um, on the map here, we found that we were going back and forth to this map a lot just to get an overview of where we were, uh, which seemed kind of a waste. Generally, we wanted to play this with full screen mode like this. So we put the map in here as a little pop-up. So as you're playing the game, if you just want to get bearings on where you are, if I want to move the screen around, uh, that's what that little map is for. That evolved into the next uh, game we did, which I'll show you in a little bit. One of the real issues we had in the interface design on this one was that we wanted to give the player some global control over the colony behavior. One of the things we wanted them to control was how many ants were foraging versus nest building versus uh, other things. Another thing we wanted them to control was how many workers were being uh, born versus uh, soldiers and breeders. We had this elaborate thing at first where we had like four bar graphs, and each one represented the percentage of, let's say, workers. One was workers, one was soldiers, one was breeders. You'd grab one bar, pull it up, the other two would go down. Uh, or you'd pull one down, the other two would go up. It was very confusing to users. We tried it another way with a pie graph where you were pulling things. And again, it was very confusing to users. What we finally came up with was this triangular control, which actually worked pretty well. In this, you just move this thing around, and it's establishing a three-way percentage. Um, in this case, it's between the amount of 
different type of casts of ant that are bred in your nest. If I want all breeders, I bring it to this vertice. If I want all workers, I bring it down here. So I can establish a three-way relationship actually pretty quickly. And this is just through testing. You know, we went through, uh, I don't know how many prototypes to discover this. Um, and then we have, of course, you can do presets. So we have three presets. I might have one set for fighting, one for making my nest bigger, and that way I can go through those very quickly. The, uh, now, the help system on Sim Earth was the shift click. On this one, we decided to make it a little more basic. We just put little uh, question marks in each window. If you hold down the question mark, it basically shows you all the icons. This is not unlike kind of the current paradigm of the pop-up context-sensitive help. We did that in every window in the product. So in this window, we have the same thing. And in the map window, we have the same thing, too. The, uh, there were a couple things we did experimentally in this game, which I, oh, just very briefly, these are the global displays. These are pheromone displays you see from the ants. One of the main things we were trying to communicate in this product was why ants are so cool. I mean, ants are really, really cool. You have these little things that just operate on these local rules and have no idea what's going on. But yet, when you add them up, you get this surprisingly intelligent colony. And this is really what we were trying to communicate to the user in this game. And that's why it was important that they saw the pheromones they were dropping, because we were actually trying to build the behavior. We were actually building the simulation fairly close to real rules of ants. Um, as an example, there's a thing that uh, somebody did. I forgot his name. He did it in a simulation. It was interesting, because it was one of the few cases where the real behavior of an organism was discovered through simulation. And people always wondered how ants were able to effectively sort larvae at different stages. In other words, they'll have one little room with the uh, little eggs that were just laid, another room with the medium-sized larva, another room with the almost fully grown ones. These larvae at each stage put out a particular odor. These ants apparently, and he found this through simulation, have this very local rule, which is to say, if I'm walking around with nothing in my mandibles, and I come across a larva, and I haven't smelled its smell in my vicinity, I'll tend to pick it up. On the other hand, if I'm carrying a larva, and its smell matches the area, the smell in the local area, I'll put it down. Now, in simulation, you can just scatter these larvae all over the screen, turn this rule on, and the ants will eventually you know, pick up the larvae that are sitting by themselves, walk around with them randomly until they get to an area with similar larvae, and drop them, and thereby sort them very efficiently. So this is the kind of thing we were trying to build the simulation out of. Now, we didn't want to start the user at this level with the, you know, the mechanisms through which this emergent behavior occurs in an ant colony, we wanted to get them into the game first very quickly. You know, here's how you play the game. Here's how you walk around, get food. Here's how you uh, defeat the red ants. So what we were hoping, and was somewhat ex successful, is that we embedded in this, in the, uh, we put in this little info system. And this is kind of like a little hypercard database about ants and ant behavior. Uh, so, for instance, these are just little hot buttons. I can click on them. They have pop-up definitions. Uh, and I can kind of explore this at my leisure and find out more about ants. A lot of the information contained in here relates directly to the game and the gameplay. Um, we have sections in here that actually go into that. So I can back up. I can go to the, uh, oops, I've been eating. You die a lot in this game, but it's OK. So uh, this is actually a, a small flow chart of the simulation in the game. Oops. You get stepped on, too. So this is a very simple flow chart, much simpler than the real simulation. But we were trying to give the user the information and have the user pull the information out of the system, rather than in most educational products, it's kind of you know present the user with you know gobs of information. Here, remember this. This is cool. You know, don't doesn't matter why. Just trust us. It's cool. We wanted the users to more play this for a while and start wondering about it and say, hey, that's kind of cool. I wish I knew more about this, and then pull the information out of the system. So this was, you know, I would say, reasonably uh, successful in the game. Another kind of experimental thing we did in this was uh, this blank icon here, which we called the mystery button. Uh, what this does, this does something totally random and unexpected every time you click on it. Uh, sometimes it'll tell you a joke. Uh, Sometimes it'll play the entire sound list. Sometimes it'll you know, wipe out the entire red ant colony. Sometimes it will give you uh, 500 more ants in the black ant colony. Or it'll fill the world with food. We have about 50 random things it does. Um, we found this particularly appealed to kids. 
kids really like this idea of, you know, they've played with something, played with something, they've gone through a goal-directed state, and all of a sudden they want to get crazy. This is kind of the, let's get crazy button. You know, let's do something totally unpredictable. Um, but again, as in most cases, the adults didn't quite uh, relate to it too well. Now, on this product, I would say, I was, we were actually, our failure here was more on the marketing side. We were actually marketing this to a similar audience that SimCity and SimEarth were market, was marketed at. But what this game really appealed to were the 10-year-olds. Uh, I mean, 10-year-old girls and boys love this game. 20-year-olds uh, and up thought it was too simplistic. The model was too explicit, um, especially when they failed. They knew not only why they failed, but it was too obvious how to solve it next time. So they generally only failed once or twice. It, the game was too easy for them. Um, the kids didn't mind that it was too easy, because the kids tended to approach this more experimentally. Uh, one of the features we put in the game that again the kids seemed to appreciate more than the adults was experimental mode. Now in this mode here, I can actually put down little things to play with the ants. I can drop down little walls. So I can, you know, make mazes for my ants and see if they can figure their way out of them with their pheromones. Um, I can add food. I can feed some ants over here, kill ones over there. I can you know put an ant in the thing, feed them and see if he can find his way out with trails of food to follow. Um, I can get destructive. I can go spraying them with insecticide. The spider's pretty resistant. Red answer. <laughs> there we go. The kids would play with this for a long time. It was kind of amazing to me. Um, one of the other failure modes of this, I think, was in the uh, lack of creative input. I mean, you had this local controls and ant. You were actually building up the colony. But there wasn't a whole lot of creativity, really. Um, the ants would kind of build their colony, you know, and you'd end up with this kind of mishmash of a nest, and the nest never looked like a designer nest or anything. Uh, and it was, as a game, it, you know, it was fine, but uh, it was a little different than most of the products we did. I'm going to go to another one now, which is um, our latest version of SimCity, or the one that was released a few years ago. Two, six colors here. Now, in SimCity, you're running a city, obviously, um, rather than an ant colony or a planet. Let's start a new city. Now, in this one, we did a few things different. Um, rather than having the two windows, the local global windows, as in the other two games, we decided to try and collapse everything into one into one window. And basically to do that we added zoom. So this basically for the most part is your map view of this game. Um, I can zoom in and this is pretty much the local view but it occurs in the same window. The, uh, let me load a city. There we go. Because of the uh, isometric perspective we had here we had to add rotate buttons which wasn't too much of a problem for most people. Um, got to be a little bit of a problem on mapping some of the other data. The, uh, the centering tool actually allows you to browse around the city. Th I've always had a problem with scroll bars. Um, in SimEarth, I first noticed it, which is why we had the little map thing as you drag it around controls the uh, local window. In SimAnt, we tried to address that with the local ant that became the center point of the window. In this one, we made a special tool, the centering tool, which just allows you to browse around. From any other tool also, I can hold down the, uh, oops, that's not the right key to hold down, the option key, and go straight to the centering tool. The, uh, now this, like SimEarth, was a pretty information dense display. Uh, at this point, we had kind of changed our minds and gone to floating pallets rather than uh, an integrated window. So you'll notice this is the toolbar, and it's a separate palette. It never goes behind. We have a lot of other windows that occur in this that can be opened, but they're all done as floating pallets because we basically wanted the user to br just bring them up when they needed them and close them when they didn't. And that seemed to work pretty well, actually. I was kind of surprised. The, uh, another thing we did different was that we tried to collapse as much information as possible into this main window rather than having all these hundreds of different display modes. We basically tried to make everything graphic 
but in a way to where it kind of made sense. It matched reality. There was an you know, obvious mapping here. So just by looking at this map, pause you for a second. Just looking at this map here, the uh, user can get a sense of a lot of the data that's actually going on. I can see the density of development, the population density. I can look at the current zoning at each of these lots. If you look very closely, there's a little color-coded thing on the border. The, uh, of course, where the roads and buildings and terrain are. I can see the traffic levels. Um, I can see the power status if power goes out to a certain area. The uh, toolbar over here is organized into roughly four areas. This top area up here are the tools in the game. These are the inputs that the user is able to uh, have to the simulation. This is a bulldozer, so I can level terrain of a bulldozer. This is uh, a road. So each tool is basically one of three types. There's the, uh, basically a point select, which is like drop a tree or drop water. There's a line select, which is the road. And then there's an area select, which would be the zones. That's like a residential zone or commercial zone is an area select. Each one of those works you know, as a single click also. So the user doesn't have to worry about what mode they're in. They all, if they just want to single click each one, that works fine too. Um, one of the things, this was actually, this is a sequel to the original SimCity that we did many years beforehand. One of the things we did in the interface, the interface is much more complex, but we tried to organize these tools actually in the same order and using similar icons to the old SimCity. So people who have played SimCity before can come into this and they know the bulldozer is going to be the top icon and the road is going to be next to the uh, rail. <clears throat> the additional detail that we added in this, basically we did in pop-up menus. So whereas SimCity had a road, this one has um, five different types. Whereas SimCity had one type of residential zone, this has two. This has many different bulldozer modes. Basically, if a user just boots this up, doesn't read the manual, which is what they always do, they just click on the buttons and they work kind of like they expect them to. As they start playing with it a while, they start realizing that each of these has a pop-up menu. Some of them bring up dialogues. Uh, and that's where they can start learning the program. There's nice early, I mean, nice easy learning ramp built into the program. These things around here are basically display functions. Uh, the rotate world, zoom in, zoom out, centering tool. The sign function allows the user to put new signs in the city. Now these are kind of important a little later on because they're used in the newspaper when an event happens. Uh, you can sit there and name all the different districts of your city. You can also name the different buildings. And again, we're trying to prop up the illusion of a real city, A. We're also trying to get the user to care about the city. Now the city thing seems to work better than, for instance, the ant colony or the planet because the user actually has a lot more creative control over the system that they're dealing with. When I do something in Sim Earth, you know, no matter what I do, it's going to be erased in a billion years of erosion. Uh, in SimCity, I build a road and it stays there most of the time as long as I fund it and repair it after fires and whatnot. There's a lot more permanence to SimCity. So as a consequence, <clears throat> after I've been playing the game a while, what I've got on the screen is something very much that I've created. You know, I've built a model of a city <clears throat> as a player. In Sim Earth, I've done the same thing. <clears throat> but the changes I made just are not permanent. The bottom level down here are uh, additional windows, or actually pallets I can bring up. This is a, uh, the map, which again, here we're pretty much have replaced with the zoom out level of the, this window. But this little map allows us to bring up the data layers. So for instance, I can show uh, the crime. And it will be mapped onto this map over here. We actually originally designed this little map as a diamond shape to match the orientation of that. Users found that totally confusing. Um, <clears throat> we changed it to this. It was still confusing because the user had to make basically a 45 degree rotation in their mind between what they're seeing on this map and what they're seeing on that map. Um, we almost took it out altogether and just left it as the uh, selection icon. But uh, for some re reason, we didn't. I don't remember why. Um, but most people never, you could also grow this and use this as your primary map if you wanted to. Some people felt more comfortable with this map, but not many. Most people brought this up, used it basically just for the icons on the side to uh, apply to the bigger map. And you can zoom in and use the same controls and get a detailed area. I can actually toggle between so I can look at where the highest crime areas are in relation to the buildings and structures there. Um, these are graphs, boring graphs. These are uh, population cohort graphs. In this model, 
what you do over time is uh, in a lot of ways represented here in terms of to bring certain industries into my city. There's actually a national economic model in the game. So around the turn of the century, steel is a big national demand industry. So are textiles. Petrochemical kicks in around uh, the 50s. Uh, media, electronics kick in a little bit later. So if you want your city to grow on the industrial base, you actually have to have the right kind of uh, labor force. So for instance, if I want to get heavily into electronics, I have to have a pretty high education level. This is the education level currently in my city, broken down by age grouping. Um, I address this actually by building schools, museums, libraries. Each one of those buildings applies to a different uh, age range on this bar graph. If I build primary schools, it's going to boost the bars on the 0 to 10 year old range. Over time, these bars obviously scroll to the side. The area between 20 years old and 55 years old is considered the workforce. That's averaged into this EQ here. That average is going to affect these uh, industrial, uh, how many of these industries will come into your city and how fastly, how fast. So this is the kind of problem we were trying to get the user to confront in this game. Long-term planning issues. Like in Sim Earth, on the very bottom here, so we've gone through the tools up here, display items there, additional windows and clutter there. And the bottom, we have filters. This uh, information here, information window here was too complex for certain uh, tactical things that the users were trying to do. So these basically allow the user to turn off parts of the data that are being seen. I might just want to see the terrain or just the road network in isolation. Um, another major part of this game uh, requires that you build underground infrastructure. This shows you the underground infrastructure in the city where you're building subways, water mains, and such. The, uh, now, like, like the Gaia face in Sim Earth, we were trying to find a way to collapse information here to give the user a very quick thumbnail on how they were doing. And so we spent a lot of time building this with limited success. Um, what this is, it's the newspaper that you can get in your city. As your city gets larger, you can actually subscribe to different newspapers. Each one has a different slant on the news, a different layout. Um, but most of what you see in the newspaper actually is an output from the simulation model. Uh, you can actually click on the articles, and it kind of randomly generates an article trying to randomly describing a real problem. Um, they also describe uh, the current things that the uh, residents are having problems with. You know, like this one, for instance, this article is telling us that we need more power, having too many brownouts. Um, this is giving us a sense of the weather, weather model, which has certain inputs. This, uh, some of the papers have editorial sections where basically it's a critique of you in talking about the major problems you have to deal with. So right now education is probably a major problem. It's probably high on the list of problems that are bubbling up in the thing. So this in essence is another type of data filter. We're trying to take all the data maps inside of the city, collapse them down into a, in a way that most people are familiar with. Most people find out about the problems in their city by reading the newspaper. Um, I only wish that the technology would have been a lot better so that we could have made the newspaper much more interesting to read. What this actually was was kind of a Mad Libs thing where we had hundreds of articles, like a power shortage article, and we replaced strings like the people and place names and some adjectives to give it some random. Uh, most people burned out on this after about, oh, two weeks. You know, they'd read it for two weeks, then they'd play the game without it entirely. So it was kind of limited there. Um, one of the things I noticed when we were working on the original SimCity, we had basically, you build the city, we had all these tools, we had bulldozer, uh, roads, zones. I showed it to people and said, look, here you can build the city, it's really cool. The first thing they would do is they would find the bulldozer, because it was the first tool, and they'd try it. You know, and generally it'd blow something up, you know, you'd be bulldozing a building. And they'd say, hey, that's cool. And then they'd start attacking the city with the bulldozer, like this. And so they would sit there, it was kind of like poking an ant colony with a stick to see what happens. They, they had to perturb the system to get a sense of, you know, is it fragile or not? Or is this a painting? Or is it really a simulation? So it was, it was like they were testing the validity, of the validity of the simulation by poking at it and watching it break. Um, and this is almost universal, kids and adults. Uh, and this is just with the bulldozer. So we decided to name that the Calvin syndrome. You know, these people wanted to uh, go in and cause, you know, wreck havoc on these things, especially if they didn't build it. You know, these, these are cities I built and I labored over for hours and hours. Look at my beautiful city. Oh, I'll destroy it for you. And so 
that's when we put it in the disaster menu. Um, so in this one, you know, one of the things that a lot of people like to do is they'll spend hours building up a city and then kind of like the uh, cement random mode or experimental mode, except in this case I can, you know, bring some disaster on my city. I can call in a tornado um, or an earthquake or a monster or everything all at once. Usually, you know, these are fairly major. They destroy the city, but people just kind of like seeing the thing go down in ruins. It's like, you know, uh, I guess Nero and the fiddle or whatever. The, uh, we did this in the original SimCity. We kind of expanded on it in this one. We, uh, one of the things you can do before you get into the really full-blown plan out the city in every little detail is that you can play scenarios, um, which are pre-built cities with certain disasters or problems that you have to solve. Um, this is one of the ones I did that I like because uh, my home burned down in Oakland Hills fire several years ago and that was about uh, a little about a year and a half before we released this so I decided I'd put in the Oakland Hills scenario and I put it in my house this is my house up here on the hill and that's where it really was but now I can play the game and I can go and I can dispatch all the firefighters to save my house and let the rest of Oakland burn down but uh so at this level, SimCity becomes very tactical. Um, the time scale actually freezes to real time for the most part. Uh, the, uh, it's really funny, the disaster thing, because I think people have to <clears throat> see how fragile a system is before they really appreciate um, building it. When people would destroy the cities after I showed it to them, they'd burn out on that usually after about half an hour. They'd you know, blow them up, burn them down, hit them with an earthquake. Then they'd start rebuilding the city, and they'd start realizing how much more interesting that was. It was almost like they had to get the destruction out of their system first before they appreciated you know, that part. And then once they started building the city, they had invested so much time in building it. Some people would spend 10, 20 hours building one city that they really empathized with it. You know, then when the, uh, when the earthquake hit randomly, because you know, they do happen randomly also, they would say, you know, oh, I've been hit by an earthquake. You know, they wouldn't say, my, hit, my city's been hit by an earthquake. They'd really identify and say, I've been hit by the earthquake. Um, on this side, we, I think we did a pretty good job, whereas Sim Earth was uh, too hard, too complex, very difficult for the users to understand the conceptual mapping of the simulation. And Sim Ant was too easy. Um, this was kind of the just right in terms of what I think the uh, complexity of the simulation turned out and the visualization of it. I'm not doing too good saving my house here, but uh, the, uh, the only real criticism we got from this was more from the educational side. A lot of people, a lot of educators use these in schools, primarily uh, K through 12, and most of the educators wanted in this game the model to be more explicit. They wanted to know the algorithms for why crime happens, what causes traffic, what causes pollution, um, and Perhaps, you know, it really it needs a different design. I'm thinking that, you know, we were really focusing here on maintaining the illusion of reality with things like the newspapers and collapsing all the data into one display. And in some sense, uh, that requires almost a more structural view of the system, more like Sim Earth had. Uh, so this is, again, one of these things where you have these two things in opposition. Uh, this is most of what I wanted to show you. Um, I'd like to open it up just to questions and get a little more interactive at this point. Uh, Done? Anybody develop software that includes SimCity and teaches those things that are missing from user interfaces? Like, teaches about the models that are in there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, great. Uh, can you tell me about courseware that people have developed that teach those things that the educators want to know about? Yeah. Um, you're talking about, uh, I assume, like hard copy as opposed to in software? Yeah. yeah. Well, we have for each one of our products, we have what's called the teacher edition, and we have lesson manuals for each one which generally try to take the programs through bite-sized chunks, usually something that can be accomplished in a 30-minute time period. So they, students might concentrate on mapping in one time period or traffic in another time period. And then it would be related to a social studies course. One of the difficulties that educators have had with these products is that we've primarily been going at these with an interdisciplinary approach. Um, and so there's not always an appropriate classroom to teach these subjects in. It usually gets lumped into either the computer science curriculum or social studies or in some cases, earth science is becoming you know, lower and lower grade levels, and similar earth is a little more. But nobody takes ant behavior, you know, even though there are a lot of valuable lessons to be learned there. But uh, that's kind of the other, one of the other hurdles I think we're hitting in the education. But you know, it is being used. Other questions? 
Yeah. You talked a couple times about trying things out on groups before you put it into the final um, final design that you released. How did yeah. you structure those trials? Uh, who did you use? What kinds of things did you do? What did you watch for? Very, very informally, and we've tried a lot of things. Um, as we've gotten bigger and we have some money in the bank, we can do real focus groups now. Um, we've started doing that both uh, toward the end of a product to get a sense of how users would view this, but also at the beginning of the product before we've done any code development and presenting them with concepts and artist sketches. Um, we've avoided, I think, some costly blunders that way. But most of what we do, and I'd say the most value, comes from informal testing, showing new people. Uh, I've got a nine-year-old daughter. I show her all the time. Her friends come in. I show them. I show it to adults. To me, I kind of look at the, uh, the spectrum between kids and adults, how they relate to it. And so in some sense, we're targeting the demographic with these products. And we found that, you know, we kind of learned that lesson on Cement, that we might have had a really fun game, but if we target the wrong demographic uh, commercially, it might not be the success it could be. Um, or we might have taken different design paths had we known what the real demographic was. So one of the things we try to identify early is the demographic we're targeting. And then we get into gameplay issues. And the interface issues in terms of what confuses somebody, that seems to be a lot easier. I can show that to somebody in our accounting department who doesn't even like games. And you know, I can spend 10 minutes. And if I can't get them to figure it out, I know there's a problem. Um, generally, the kids will sit there and they'll figure it out through trial and error. You know, they have the patience and they kind of enjoy the failure. But uh, the adults really are a good test for that. You know. Yeah. Um, you, uh, Hi. Um, Hi. So you you, use, you say we here, and I guess I'm interested in a little more about you know how you work with your various colleagues, you know how you set up the group. Do you have an ant expert? You know what? <laughs> you know what's what's the team like? Well, generally, uh, on all these products, I've done the research because that's the part I really enjoy. Um, it's evolved over time. You know, the, the kind of products I'm doing now involve bigger teams. Uh, I'm doing very little, if any, coding um, on the current projects I'm working on. I'm usually doing conceptual coding or working out simulator tricks, things like that. Uh, on most of these products I've shown you, I wrote about half the code in the product, so I was heavily involved in all the details. I'm still trying to be involved on the design side. Um, on these projects, each one of these I've shown you, SimEarth, SimAnt, and SimCity, it was me and one other person in a very close collaboration. Um, with SimEarth and SimCity, it was the same person uh, for both those projects. Um, most of it really was through discussion with the other person. You know, I'd come up with an idea. He'd tell me what a terrible idea it was. He'd come up with an idea. We'd end up with some compromise in between. And that was pretty well targeted toward the final solution, except in a couple cases. If we couldn't figure it out between ourselves and it wasn't an obvious um, solution, that's when we would start showing it to people. We'd both kind of broaden the discussion with more people. Um, that process is evolving as these games get more complex. The current games we're working on are far more complex than what I've shown you today. Um, so now we're into a design process that usually involves three or four, five people. But depending on whose project it is, there has to be one person with the X on their back that's going to call the shots. So you might have a group discussion over is this icon blue or red, or is this game about ants or planets? But some person has got to be pulling that thing through. I've never seen a product design through a committee that came out well. You really have to have one vision, I think, behind it. Um, and it's really hard to communicate that vision. I spend a lot of my time, time trying to do that. I have this idea in the back of my head about why it would be so cool to have a simulation of a thunderstorm, and what it would look like, and what the visuals would be like. And I, this is a real example. I go around explaining this to people, and they stare at me with a blank stare. You know, because I'm seeing these things in my head, these elaborate three-dimensional displays, and these I kind of know what the simulation would be and the kind of expected emergent behavior coming out of the system. I just cannot convey that to somebody to the point where they're going to drop a half million dollars on it to develop a game. Um, luckily, I'm in the point where I can kind of push it through and make it happen, you know, just because they'll trust me on it. But I think uh, in our industry, that's kind of a really big issue. You have uh, on the financial side, people want control, they want predictability. They don't know what you're talking about, but you really all have to have one person with that idea all the way through from form to style to mechanics to plumbing about how to make that idea happen. So, yeah. Uh, who are your customers? What are they like? And I'm talking about the people who buy the product initially and then also the ones who are repeat or um, really committed users. I'm 
thinking of demographics and also other characteristics of these customers. Well, obviously it varies by products. We have other products that I haven't shown today which are more kid-based. We have SimTown, which is kind of like SimCity. Yeah, I'm for thinking, say, for the Sim SimCity 2000 that we just Like saw. the kind of things I've shown today? Generally, our demographic um, falls between about 20 and 35 or 40. It's actually surprisingly old for computer games. Uh, when we do focus groups, um, we'll invite people who are registered customers. So we recently had a focus group for the next version of SimCity, the next generation we're working on, and we pulled kind of a random sampling of SimCity 2000 customers. The age ranges were surprisingly high. I mean, there were some people in there that were 60, 65 years old that were avid gamers, which kind of surprised me. There's, uh, in the game field, basically there's almost three major areas. There's kind of the kids' early education market, and that's primarily the purchase decision there is adult-based, I mean the parent-based. The parent decides, oh, you know, little Tommy should learn math. I'll buy him Math Blaster. Or, you know, I want uh, Susie to learn how to read. I'll buy this. Then you get into from about the 10 or 12 to 16, it's kind of what we call Nintendo Gulch. Okay, this is the cart machine territory. This is where the kids are buying Nintendo, Sega, Sony, all that stuff. They're driving the purchase decision. You know, they want, you know, Hack and Slash 3, and they're the ones that will actually spend their money on Hack and Slash 3 in that area. And then you have kind of the adult hardcore gamer market. But across that whole thing, in kind of a broad, thin veneer, is the PC gaming market, which we actually have, you know, a lot of eight, ten year olds playing SimCity. You know, either their parent bought it for them or they wanted to buy it or they got it from their friend or whatever. But, you know, we also have the 15-year-olds who aren't into the hack and slash that are buying it and playing it. Yeah, I guess, I guess what I'm getting at is what do you know about those that, that rather, uh, you have a rather unusual or different game yeah. in SimCity. What do you know about them besides their age and their sex? Oh, you mean how much information have we collected on them? Yeah, and what, what, really, what distinguishes the person who gets this and uses it from another 65-year-old or 30-year-old who isn't? Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, um, right now the computer game market is still what I would call kind of the hobbyist market. So these are people that, you know, in some sense have some time on their hands, are willing to devote it to a hobby, and they've decided that hobby is computers. Um, that's kind of what, how our, the PC gaming industry has grown, which is a very different model than from the Nintendo industry. The Nintendo industry has gone in and decimated the model building hobby toy industry is what it's done. Uh, but the people who buy this, you know, we, we've actually done a lot of things where we ask them, you know, kind of game, what other games do you have? And we look at the intersections between our games and the other games. And we haven't, you know, come to any really firm conclusions. Actually, if anything, our games have a much broader, I think, demographic than most games. We tend to have a lot of players who only play two or three games, and this is one of them. Or these kind of games are the only games that appeal to them. And it's just the fact that there aren't more of them out there that keeps them from becoming a hardcore gamer. So, uh, and we get a lot of kids like that too, who you know maybe don't play that many PC games, but they'll play Sim Ant because they think it's cool, because their parents gave it to them. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what projects are you working on now? And uh, if you don't, if you'd rather not talk about that, uh, what projects or models uh, had you considered before that were kind of interesting but you didn't do? You mean like system? What systems have I considered modeling? Right. Oh, God. And also, and also, what systems are you currently working on? If you, if you can talk about them. Okay, well, one thing we're working on is a, uh, we've been kind of interested in our company for a long time about the idea of data portability. Um, really, let me back up just a little bit here, and this might be a little bit more of an answer than you were looking for, but uh, most of the game industry right now is built on kind of the movie model. So you spend a lot of money developing one big title, you come out with it, you advertise it, it either you know, goes or it dies, and then you do the next one separate, except you know, for sequels. There's, the one consistent genre that does better than any other genre in the game industry is sequels. Um, now what we've tried to do, and we're kind of working on slowly over time, is to build our games more as a hobby model, where people buy and collect things, but they relate to the last things they collected. You know, it's like a train set. You build this train set, and people, some people get into the building the hills and the cliffs and the mountains and the trees really detailed. They could care less about the train. Other people get into the village or the track switching and the scheduling. Everybody can kind of come into that, take their particular slant on it, their interest, and focus in that area in great detail. Um, I'd like to see the game industry kind of evolve that way. And part of that is I want the games to actually be able to uh, have persistent data that can move from one game to another, or have a large data set that I can reuse in different ways. 
Um, let me show you something real quick here, which is kind of along those lines. Just, this is just a kind of a little, this is one of the things I'm working on, by the way. But it's, uh, it'll give you some sense of what I'm talking about. Um, this is a game I call Dollhouse. And if this looks familiar, it's because I've just loaded a SimCity file into here. OK, so what we're seeing is a SimCity file. But now at this point, I can actually zoom down to the street level. This zoom in here, this little area right there by the street is what I'm zooming into. I can keep zooming in, and now I can get a little person. This is me. I'm actually controlling this person with a puppet. I can wave and walk around and do things. Um, I can actually walk anywhere in the city here. Uh, we haven't, don't have the full database in this, but I, I have a database for all the roads and the terrain. Um, it's very feasible for us to put a database in for every building in SimCity so that I could actually walk anywhere in the city I've created and uh, into any building. And so the tools in this game are more architectural tools. So uh, I can, let's see, real quickly, I'll build a, a foundation here. Oops, yeah, there we go. Um, this is a wall tool. I have different wall styles. So what we're trying to do here is we're designing kind of a little, like a little CAD program that a, a 10-year-old could use, for instance. So very simple tools, kind of like you would build a little dollhouse. Um, so I'll just make a really quick little, quick and dirty architecture here. Um, we also have landscaping tools. So part of this game is, you know, planning my yard. Um, we've played around with some L systems for generating the plants in real time, which a little too slow, actually. So these are windows. Um, I can zoom into the house. So this, right now, is not much of a defined game. Um, but this is almost more of what I would consider a hobby. I could take a city that I built in SimCity, and now I can come live in it. I can actually you know, stake a claim. I can uh, build my house, and I can decorate it and invite my friends over. We're looking at actually having like a little family model inside of here. So that. Uh, There'll be little personality models for these guys. There's behavior embedded in some of these objects. So the cool thing about this game is that almost the entire simulation is data-driven <laughs> at, at a local level. Um, so for instance, I click on an object. Um, <laughs> now what's interesting here is that uh, that person, in the person's data structure, there's no knowledge of any objects in this environment whatsoever. The object itself contains the descriptions of how a person interacts with it and why, what the animation sequence would be, and the scheduling. So the, this is my person. This is my little avatar. I can also add, uh, pop in some simulated people that will walk around and do things. That right now, they, they're kind of ghosts because they don't know about the walls. <laughs> but uh, they'll walk around. They'll have conversations. Some of them will panhandle each other. Uh, what's cool is that. Uh, the behavior is entirely distributed in the environment. So a person's in a room. They have certain motivations, needs. They might be hungry, sleepy, lonely, angry. They scan the room for people and objects. And the objects are all kind of advertising. You know, if you're angry, pick up me and throw me. If you're hungry, eat me. You know, And there's the communication there is all data driven. And even the animations. So the animation of these people is done through this kind of component driven geometry. So they don't have to know how to ride a bike or sit on the toilet. The object tells them how to when they come up and say, OK, you know, you're going to make me less hungry. I'm going to interact with you. What do I do? The object tells it what to do. The cool thing about this is that we can drop new objects in later. You know, maybe it's network based, or maybe it's something else. We can even have tools where the users build these objects. Maybe one person is totally into designing furniture or designing exercise equipment. I don't know what, uh, exercise videos. But if we had a tool to where the user could build these things, they could then post them on the net, and other people could download them. And then the environment gets more rich. And so to me, this is what I want to move towards, more of the hobbyist kind of a thing, distributed environment um, with objects that can move from one game to another. So this might be you know, one game I'm playing in here. I can, this is actually a very similar data structure to Doom. I could be in here in a 3D point of view, you know, shooting the person on the toilet if I wanted to. Maybe it's a different game player in a different game, but still running off the same server. So you know, in a way, you can think of this as a graphic mud or something like that. But uh, um, so What about from person to? Yeah, go ahead. What well, I was finished. Person to person, you talk about like the information obtained that's contained within the objects, but uh, so it can be information, I guess, in a person, another person that you would want to interact with in the environment. Did oh you, yeah. Have you looked at any reasons why you would go, want to do that? Or oh yeah, that I mean that's that's the hard problem. 
I mean, <laughs> simulating ants is hard enough. <laughs> when you get to people, <laughs> there's really no hope. But <laughs> well, yeah, the, there are two issues here. You can look at this as a technology. It's not a product right now. Um, and there are future directions this could go. I could see this becoming, let's say, a multiplayer network mud kind of a thing. You might have a thousand people playing SimCity from the bottom up, each person building their own house in a big multi-user space, in which case that issue is a little less important because most of the people are real people and you're dealing with puppets. As a standalone game, which is probably our, our closer target, we have to deal with the problem you're bringing up, which is how do we deal with the people to people? And it's hard. I mean, there's just, I'm sure Terry can <laughs> elaborate on that more than I can. But you know, the best thing we can do is prop up a convincing illusion. Um, we don't have to be doing a valid simulation of human personality. What we have to do is we have to put up something that's ambiguous enough to where somebody can read in what they want. Actually, in this thing, what I have right now are people come up and they converse, but you don't hear what they're saying. They just gesture, and sometimes they look mad, sometimes they kind of look contemplative. Um, it's kind of interesting uh, how much people will read into that. There's this kind of dynamic that we've seen again and again where something happens in SimCity and they said, oh, I was running my nuclear reactor near the red line and then there was so much smoke coming out of it, this plane crashed and because of that, this and that happened. And they'll describe this long, causal chain of events that I know does not exist. You know, I designed the simulation, I know that there's no linkage between the power output of the power plant and the plane's crashing, but they're convinced it exists. Right, yeah. Yeah, they're using it as a medium to tell stories about, where yeah. they're you know using it as a piece of paper to write. Yeah, th that's exactly right. You know, this is there's a parallel simulation going on here in the game. Everybody's taking a linear path through this, and they're basically most people will attempt to understand things like this with a story. You know, think about I did this, then that happened because of that, and so the story becomes kind of their logical connection, their logical reverse engineering of the simulation that they're playing inside of. Um, now, the, uh, on the people side, I think we can do a lot in this as a product by propping up that illusion of people. You know, again, if this is a dollhouse, uh, we don't want the dolls to be sentient things. We want the dolls to be interesting enough to where I can play games with them. Um, there was actually a really interesting doll that this company came out with. It was, oh, it was a World of Wonder. They had this really cool doll. I've got a couple of them after they went out of business. It's called the Julie doll. But it was like this $250 doll with voice recognition. And it said all these things. It had this you know, huge amount of ROM with digitized speech in it. And so it would sit there and try and have stupid conversations with you. And really, it was kind of Eliza, you know, where it had keywords it would recognize and give you these kind of uh, noncommittal responses. But in the testing of that, uh, well, first of all, it was a $300 doll. Who's going to buy the kid a $300 doll? So it was really more, a, it was actually the only doll I've ever seen that appealed to grown men. <laughs> grown men love this. I mean, this is a hacker's doll. But uh, they put. I talked to the guy who was working on this project, and he said they put this in focus groups with the girls, and they'd play with it for a while, and then after about a half an hour, they'd take the batteries out <laughs> and keep playing with it. And what was happening is that the girls were propping up this elaborate fantasy you know, in their play, and the dolls were supposed to be a structure for that fantasy. They weren't supposed to be the fantasy. The, the doll was telling them what the fantasy was, and it was conflicting with what the girls were saying. And so it was interfering actively with their fantasy and their play. So in that regard, I think we can actually kind of take that path with these people, and all we have to do is deal with them on a very local, you know, kind of a state machine, Bradenburg machine kind of level, and say that they're angry, and they're hungry, and they're sleepy. And then we can actually do some things where maybe they have a little, uh, what you might call structural ambiguity about what they're actually saying. You know, one of the thoughts I had about this project in particular is that you'd see the people go up and they'd talk, and there would be some tenor, some kind of a, a flavor to their conversation, but it would be more like peanuts. The, when they did the, PV, the TV show of Peanuts, you'd hear the adults talking, and the adults would always be rah, 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 or you know, soft or loud. You could tell if they were mad or angry or what, but you wouldn't hear what they were saying. You'd have to read that into it. So uh, I think this is the area where we sidestep the issue just because, you know, as a commercial company, we have to ship a game. We're not doing a research project. So that's a long-winded answer. Sorry. <laughs> yeah? Um, if you do do that and you have um, people can read into what people are actually doing in the game. Um, won't that sort of interfere with their expectations in the simulation if the simulation doesn't actually um, meet those expectations? If they're reading too much into it and it's not really happening that way. 
Uh-huh. Won't they be sort of misled in their um, expectations? That really comes down to what the simulation is. Um, it's uh, that I think it would be addressed on the game design side. Um, again, I mean, just in terms of reality, I don't think there's any way I'm going to come anywhere close to simulating a person. Um, with a lot of tricks, I can have these people walking through the day, getting up, uh, taking a bath or shower, fixing breakfast, going to work, while at the same time deciding that I'm bored, I'm going to sit on the couch, I'm going to turn on the TV. And how you make that into a game design might have a lot to do with how valid the simulation of the people has to be. You know, if it's a story kind of a game where you want drama to unfold at the right time and the conversation between these two people is a crucial thing that happens before he gets really upset and does that, then yes, the model would need to be a real simulation. I really don't think we're anywhere near that, though. I mean, uh, really, I think, you know, unless you're in a very, very tightly confined domain, uh, you're going to have a hard time dealing with an open-ended simulation about people in that way. So uh, I, I think really, unfortunately, we, we're not there yet. And I think it'll be quite a long time before we are. So really, we have to constrain what the user is doing. You know, maybe it's just a dollhouse. Maybe all I do is I kind of, uh, I have to get two people to meet at a party. And everything else is kind of indeterminate about what they say and all that. And I'm moving furniture around. So there are a lot of game design things we can do with this without doing a personality model. So it's an AI game versus uh, a multi-user game would be easier to design than an AI game. So you're, you're saying an, a multi-user game would be easier to design than an AI game because you could oh, use yeah, other people. Oh, yeah, I think so. It's just the technology of communicating and time lags. This is how interesting. I mean, you're always building models of the system you're playing with. It's easy to build a model of a stupid computer agent. It's hard to build a model of, you know, your head while I'm talking to you. That's what's interesting is trying to reverse engineer your thought process. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of like commercial services, worlds away, and habitat things that have been done that only have other people, yeah, like robots or anything, and they're pretty successful just because of that. Yeah, the people are pretty interesting. I had a question yeah. related to that, which is. The standard modes of gameplay are individual and then competitive. There's more than one person. And it would seem that your games are the most likely of any to have a mode of multiplayer cooperative play, where you're working. You mentioned five people playing similar, and they're trying to work together to accomplish something. Does yeah. that happen very much, or pretty much when people are playing with them, it's one person? Uh, well, yeah, actually, it happens a lot, um, especially more with the kids and the adults. Um, the kids, and not just our games, but other games too. Uh, one of the interesting things I've noticed with my daughter is that she almost never plays computer games or video games by herself. But if her friend's over, they'll both play them. And usually it's one at the controls, and the other one is the backseat driver. And it's the dialogue between the two that really makes the game interesting. So really, for them, the game is facilitating a social interaction. Um, and the game itself is not interesting enough for them to really spend much time with it. But in terms of it facilitating a social interaction, that's when uh, it really is valuable. And I think a lot of kids, that's a big attraction of this Nintendo Gulch thing is this peer group that's out there, and they may have Super Mario Brothers. And I'm motivated to get better at it and find the hidden level so I can tell Tommy. And it's kind of like social currency that I'm passing around, this knowledge I have about the system. And then Tommy comes over to my house and we play it together. So really, in some sense, I think that's kind of cool, the social interaction that these systems involve. In our games, um, it's, it's, much more easy, it's much easier for players to do that in our games because of the time scale involved. It's not like Doom where I can't stop and think and every second you know, I'm moving. It's not like driving a car. Our games are more like you know, sitting back and taking a leisurely stroll. So I think the time scale probably has a lot to do with that. Yeah. What, sort of looking back to where you were uh, 10 or 15 years ago, what, what have been some of the surprises in how things have gone? Surprises in the industry, or surprises well, in uh, just uh, the I, I, working I as a designer? In the industry, and where where games are, and what the direction that they, they've taken. I'm kind of surprised right now that there seems to be a shift, in some sense, away from deeper games. And it, this kind of happened with Doom, and I've played enough Doom myself that I can't sit here and criticize Doom for not being fun. It's a very different kind of thing than SimCity. Um, right now. That's driving a lot of the industry. Uh, related to that is the distribution system, which I don't think you want to hear about distribution because it's an extremely boring topic. Um, but that's really changed a lot in our industry. I think that's probably going to be 
the uh, biggest change we're going to see in our industry over the next few years, um, as all of a sudden it gets interesting again, and hopefully we get into uh, perhaps a network-based distribution, alternative distribution system. I think that more than anything else will have the biggest impact on the kind of games that are developed and the economies of developing those games. Uh, right now, a lot of things are filtered out in the distribution process that are really creative and really cool, and you just never see, and nobody can afford to develop because they won't get on the shelf. Um, so that's kind of a big surprise is how quickly that's happening, this whole net thing, but surprising everybody. Uh, on the technology side, 3D seems to be getting uh, 3D immersive stuff seems to actually have some staying power, which has surprised me. I thought 3D was going to come and go as a fad, but now I'm thinking, you know, it actually is going to stay. Uh, and a lot of that is just that people have gotten so accustomed to immersive environments through things like Doom or some of the current crop of the uh, game consoles, the PlayStation, the new uh, Nintendo Ultra 64 that's coming out. You're going to have a whole new generation of kids that are kind of going to be weaned on, you know, are, you know, grown up on this 3D paradigm, you know, used to 3D interfaces, used to navigating around in the 3D space. And so I think that's probably going to remain with us. Um, more questions? We pushed right on time. Just